Hey folks, how's it going? Welcome to another episode of Acoustic Guitar I.O. It's been quite a while since I posted an interview, so I'm very excited to bring you this one. This one is with Jen Butterworth, a phenomenal guitar player who plays around the Glasgow area. And she was over for the Folk Festival, the Aran Folk Festival, which took place last weekend, the weekend of the 7th of June 2019. And she was playing with Laura Beth Salter on mandolin. Their set was phenomenal. Thoroughly enjoyed watching them. And I always enjoy listening to them play. Jen agreed to come round and sit down with me for a chat before she went on stage. And so I'm going to bring that to you shortly. I'd just like to say thank you to Jen because it was, it was quite a big ask. She's come over just to play a gig. And just after a sound check, she came round and we had a wee chat, so uh, I know she didn't have to do that, and I'm very grateful that she did. So thank you, Jen. Much appreciated. So without any further ado, I'm going to bring you the interview. I hope you enjoy it, and uh, I'll see you again at the end of the video. Welcome to my house, Jen. Thanks for having it's, me. It's lovely to have you here. <laughs> so you're over for the Aran Folk Festival, yep. which has started today. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's exciting. We've been down for a sound check already, playing later on tonight. So. Brodick Hall? Yep. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. going to be good. It's going to be hot, I think. Yeah. It's quite muggy just now. It was, um, I think the first time that I came here was absolutely years ago, and uh, I got really, really sunburned. Aye. First time I came, and then last time we were here, I chucked it down. So getting all in different weather. So, so yeah. is this your third one? Um, this is the third one that I've played with Laura Beth, and mm. I played one more before that with uh, Anna Massey and Myra Green, like years and years ago. So, ah, yeah. okay, yep. Yeah, I've seen Anna and Myra. I think the first time was here. Mm -hmm. Second time I saw them at the conservatoire. I think I took, oh, yeah. I took Freya with me. Oh. And it was, that was a lovely gig though. Yeah. Yeah. I must not have been here, I got here in 2008 Yeah. and the folk festival was revived in 2008. Yeah, I think it must have been about, I mean me and Anna Myers started playing together in like 2003 so it might have been about 2005 or six or something that, Aye. that, we, that we played here. So the first time I saw Anna Maybe. was at Celtic Connections mm -hmm. and she played with Tony McManus, uh, who's the sole last guy, John Doyle. Yeah. Oh, was there, there was like a guitar yeah. summit, wasn't there? Yeah, that's what it was called. Was that a piping centre? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, I was at that gig, it was great. And it was the first time I'd seen Anna, and I was just blown oh, away. Oh, she's amazing. She's just, so amazing. You it don't was kind of cool growing up. We, we played together for like six years, and yeah. it was all through all through the time that we were at uni, and then a wee bit after that as well. And it's just so cool, like kind of growing up with somebody who plays like that. Uh -huh. I think I'd, I never really realised how lucky I was to be around both of them you know, yeah. at, at that time and stuff. It was just a really, really cool thing. Just playing tunes all the time. Yeah, yeah. and I saw you, must have been your second one then, your second Iron Folk yeah. Festival. And yeah. you played with LB and I, again, I was just blown away. Oh. And I thought it's it's so amazing to see the traditional Scots Irish repertoire mm -hmm. being modernised and, and made all these young people playing, especially women, you know, yeah. that's, that's mm -hmm. an amazing thing. Yeah. Because I have travelled a lot to America to play at bluegrass festivals and stuff, uh -huh. and it's mostly men. It's changing a bit now. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, uh -huh. 2005, 2006. It was all guys. Yeah, you know? I, there's, there's been a definite shift in, in the way people sort of talk to you, you know, and, and stuff, yeah. you know, in comparison to, to maybe, you know, I, I think I, I used to get cra congratulated a lot more for playing like a man, and I don't think anybody would probably dare say that now <laughs> well, that's a good thing. But, but maybe 10 years ago they, they would have done so mm. um, so there's definitely been a shift and I think there's been a really lovely sort of celebration of women playing music which hopefully is going to shine a light on it a bit more to help encourage more young women to get get involved and in, in stuff as well I think there was I really like the there's a phrase that somebody used which was if you can't see it you can't be it which I don't necessarily agree with because I ended up where I am without looking at another mm. female guitarist as a role model but I do think there's something in that that if you see women out there playing on the big stages and things like that yeah. that you're more inclined to, to think about doing it yourself as well because you can imagine yourself doing it. Like the Taylor Swift effect? Yeah. Apparently yeah, so. guitar sales 
increased a lot after yeah, she yeah. came on the scene. Interestingly enough, it was a female guitar player that inspired me. Oh, really? It was Suzanne Vega. Oh, cool. And I'm still a huge fan of Suzanne's. Mm -hmm. And the other player was Bert Jansh. Oh, yeah. First yeah. time I heard Bert. Yeah. I got my first guitar at 21. Mm -hmm. So it was a little bit late, but I jumped in with both feet. Yeah. Know. It's but an amazing thing. I think if you get obsessed with anything, you can totally, you know, you can come on so quickly with it. I think you're so much more aware of learning when you're a little bit older, though. So I think that can be a wee bit stressful but mm. I think you can still make quite good progress if you've got if you've got the time and the sort of curiosity it takes discipline it. though once you, once you have a family it, yeah, it yeah. all changes yeah mm -hmm. and just trying to balance it all I know you're on the road a lot yeah. so I mean that's going to be most of your time I presume but you also yeah. teach I do yeah I've got um, I teach two days a week in the conservatoire on the Chad music course and I've, so I've got some classes that I run and then the rest of the time there's like three of us that are in sort of week to week all through the year that kind of run the course there's a head of department who's in all the time Josh and then two of us that have these two day a week contracts and uh, so it's nice but they're they're quite flexible relatively you know touch wood they're <laughs> relatively flexible and um, so it means that they, they can support people who are out there working in the scene because um, I think we really want the staff that are in there to, to have that really hands-on knowledge of what's going on outside. So um, so yes, I've got a fairly flexible two days a week and then I teach an adult evening class on a Monday night at Glasgow for the workshop and then the rest of the time it's just out and about doing stuff and I try and slot my two days at the conservatoire around the other things that I'm doing as well so it's sort of like a weird Tetris of time <laughs> so, so it'll be because it used to be that I'd do two days on like a Tuesday and Wednesday and then I'd get to the end of the week and it'd be like oh now I'm well over the time that I was supposed to be in because I've just nipped in to do extra things or mm -hmm. all that so now I kind of I've, I've sort of got used to it but I've been in I've been working in there in some sort of shape or form for the last 10 years so oh, okay. it's, um, I got the job that I'm in now in I think 2012 or thereabouts. And is that where you studied? No, I studied at Swift Clyde. I did right. the Clyde Music Course. And um, and back when I was studying, I went to uni in like 2000, 2001. And, uh, and the soloists, a lot of the soloists were coming out of the RSAMD at the time. Yeah. And a lot of the backline players were coming out of Swift Clyde. I think just because we were covering like maybe a range of genres, whereas the soloists were kind of really focused on on the tradition and, yeah. and on the specific style that they were playing in. So so myself, Duncan Lyle, Martin O'Neill, Mike Bryan, Anna Massey, mm -hmm. like we all came out of, of the Applied Music course. So I think we were kind of like crossing over slightly different genres all the time and mm -hmm. it kind of helped when you when you were looking at accompaniment, I suppose. And on guitar, did you start with backup or tunes? Um, I started with backup because I, I learned the fiddle first. And I was playing tunes in the pub and stuff. And then I was singing and I just learned the guitar. I didn't ever learn the guitar to think that I'd back tunes and never imagined that I'd be doing what I do now <laughs> at all. Right. Um, I was just, I really liked singing folk songs and um, and I'd, you know, I was just kind of getting slightly like more and more creative. I used to like um, learn the chord boxes at the back of like Oasis books and stuff like that. And, <laughs> and then and then learn some folk songs and try and put the chords together with with it. And I was always quite curious about the way that harmony worked and and learning about how things fitted together and stuff. So I think that's what got me started. And then um, I just started back in tunes just because I got kind of bored of playing the fiddle in the sessions. I quite enjoyed doing a bit of both and. It just kind of went from there. Mm. It's sort of weird. It sort of kind of randomly ended up. Your backup style, I admire greatly. You, oh, you do a lot of interesting chord inversions mm -hmm. and a lot of open strings. Are you playing in stand up most of the stand, time? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I do one in the Canaris Quintet. I've got one piece that is in dad gad. It turns into no, sorry, into drop D. Like halfway through, I just tune the bottom string down just to get a bit more. Oof, yeah. out of a D, a D tune but um, apart from that yeah, it's, I, I kind of, because I've played so much in sessions over the years and that's where I've experimented the most and come up with new ideas or things like that, I j because they change key all the time I just sort of mm. I sat in standard and I was just really really happy with that um, but really wanted that idea of the ringing strings thing, yeah, like, that was always well. my so I don't really 
I play all these like, different chords and stuff, but I couldn't really tell you what the names, the actual names of the chords yeah. are. It's more the intention of what that chord means to me at the time that I'm playing it. Um, so I remember, like, I've been mucking about with different, um, different chords in different keys for singing, and I got to the point where I knew all the standard basic ones that I needed. Yeah. And I didn't really want to go into sort of bar chord stuff because I felt like it was too closed. And I was kind of lazy, didn't really want to be, you know, holding down all these. <laughs> but um, so I ended up writing the whole neck of the guitar out on a sheet of paper once. And and I remember looking at it and going, right, I know generally what notes are in what chords that I want. So if I just try and find those ballpark ideas, then I can find other chords that might go. And that's how I started. And then once you find a few of those, um, you sort of stumble across other shapes and things that work with them and I guess that's how I, I formed a lot of the chords that I play um, and I've learned a lot from covering different guitar players gigs over the years as well mm. so there's been different voicings and stuff that I've been like oh I've never done that myself but in in this show I'm going to play like this guitar player so I'm going to and then you just adopt those all those different things into your own style yeah. which is really cool it's fun I should actually watch some some more I'll see you play tonight Mm -hmm, yeah. I'm going to bring my camera if that's oh, cool. okay take yeah, some yeah, film definitely. I'd love to pick up some of that style I did yeah. have Tony McManus show me some yeah. last time he was here he came around and I had a wee lesson with him and he showed me some backup stuff it's, it's been so interesting because I've been thinking a lot about like teaching guitar quite recently it's, there's been a lot of people who've been in touch with me about like private lessons and stuff and there's just not enough time mm. and I was like right how do you teach because I think a lot of guitar players over the years have been quite scared of giving away their tricks. Like really? thinking that, yeah, I think there's just this worry that it's like, oh, if you give away all your secrets, then somebody else will come along and steal all your jobs. <laughs> but I don't, I think it's so much, I've, I guess as I've become more confident as a player, it, the more I've realised that it's about, it's about your own personality and what the stamp that you put on what it is that you do and not necessarily the tools that you use along yeah. with that. You know, it's, it's, it's the way that you... It's the sensitivity that you have and that you feel when you're accompanying and stuff that's, yeah. I think, more important, I guess, in a way. So um, I think then you feel a lot more comfortable going, right, OK, here are the tricks. But then I guess it means that what you're teaching isn't necessarily the thing that I feel is is the most important thing. It's like, how do you teach the sensitivity and the ability to improvise an accompaniment that fits with the tune? Like, you start with the tricks. But where, how, how do you get to the next level and stuff is something that I'm kind of, I'm really intrigued about because it just happened for me. I don't know how it did. I just kept playing and experimenting until I knew what to play. What were you listening to? Little Feet. <laughs> <laughs> I used to take the top 40 and, oh, and learn all the songs. Yeah. Take that and all that. It's like when I was like 13, 14. Right. Natalie and Brulia. I remember learning all of all the pop songs and stuff. Yeah. Um, but my dad had a record collection, still has, I've actually got it now, nicked it off him, which was Bert Yance, Rosemary Lane. Aye. Um, loads of Little Feet. Low George, um, like but like Ocean Records and Dedan and, and, and all sorts. Like there's a Frankie Gavin one that was amazing and I just remember listening to like a mixture of so many different things, but because we didn't really have a huge amount of money for buying music and music wasn't unless you could buy CDs you, it, it wasn't yeah. as accessible I, I think it's wonderful it's more accessible now but at the same time it's not great for musicians careers obviously yeah but at the same time you've got like the whole world on your doorstep but instead it was more kind of like just listen to whatever you can my dad used to take the folk programs right. so I'd take the top 40 he'd take the folk programs and I'd have some sort of weird mashup of the whole lot <laughs> Um, and just used to try and if you, I think if you try and put anything onto the guitar like whether it's like a pop song or a folk tune or whatever you're always developing your knowledge of chords and mm -hmm. and, and all of that so I think it all ends up influencing you know, So it's interesting that you said you're not sure sometimes what the names of the chords would be yeah. when you're building them do you use any theory when you're coming up for coming up with your own Ah, yeah, well, in the back of my mind, I've got, you know, it's, I guess it's just that it's, you know, when it's like add, add nine or, you know, there's, there's like, if you've got like an extra three notes in a chord, apart from the, the triad that you're using, yeah. it's stuff like that that's like, even to write stuff like that down it takes ages, do you know what I mean? Because right. it's just too many, it's like easier just to write D, you know, or whatever, unless yeah. it's a really fundamental note that you're like, 
that has to be in it to fit yeah. with the tune. So like a lot of the time it's like if, if it's a major seven because you've, you're trying to imply a different thing or whatever. But um, but in the back of my mind, I've thought a lot about theory over the years to the point that you don't need to think about it anymore. You, uh -huh. It's just something that's like intuitive. Um, and you definitely have to switch on your theory brain a lot in certain situations, but I'd like to think now it kind of comes from my gut instead. You know, it's like yeah. it, you can sort of feel what's right and I think I remember speaking to a, a friend of mine who plays jazz and it was, you know, you, you work and you work and you work to absorb all this huge amount of theory, but then you actually have to forget it in order to harness yeah, it. Yeah. And I think that's that's such an important thing. Um, it's, it's always there, but it's, it's not the thing that drives you because if you are driven by theory, I think it holds you back from maybe a kind of like creativity that would just spontaneously come out of you. I think yeah. once you start thinking about what's supposed to be correct, if you look at a folk tune, um, if you have to write down the, the chords that actually work with each bar, you're going to restrict yourself so much. Mm -hmm. And and you remove a lot of tension, I think, at that point as well, because you're just thinking about what's, what's theoretically correct as opposed to what might feel right. Yeah. And, and, and kind of like maybe... Yeah, yeah, cause a bit of tension or, or make the listener feel a certain way or whatever, there's something different. It's fascinating. I'm, it's, it's I'm dealing cool. with that now myself, with yeah. learning theory because I never really did. Oh, yeah. And I'm yeah. teaching now and uh -huh. I kind of have to know it so that yeah. I can explain things. It's definitely important. Or at least understand way. why things work mm -hmm. that I just do, you know. Yeah. But you were talking about uh, coming up with getting the theory out of the way sort of thing. Yeah. And you talked about driving, you know, it's a bit like driving. When you're learning to drive, it's all theory and it's all mechanics and it's all yeah. like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not that you can really be creative when you're driving unless you're an <laughs> F1 driver or something. But, you know, the creativity side of things, I play bluegrass, that's my favourite sort of style. Yeah. And some of the bluegrass solos are phenomenal. Yeah. And so I've been playing, I play with Donald. He plays yeah. fiddle and guitar. So we played together for years. And it would get to a solo break and he would give me that look and I would just freeze up and I'd start falling all over the place. Mm. And I just couldn't relax. And it's only recently started to change since I've actually been looking at theory and performing more, so I'm getting mm. over that sort of anxiety. Yeah. And finding things that I can express myself. And it's, it's really rewarding when you get something right. Mm -hmm. And it's about the fear of not worrying if you fall off it. Yep. Yeah, Which definitely. Just that kind of psychological. It's like, what's the worst that can happen? Yeah. You might feel a bit silly. It doesn't matter. But know? even if I watch an artist, a professional, you know, a famous musician, falling off something, and I'm in the audience and I don't care. Nobody mm -hmm. cares. And yeah, I know that nobody it's cares. Like, it's interesting to find out how they get back on it. Do you know what I mean? It's like because yeah, yeah. we've had times when, like, me and LB have played <laughs> together for so long that there'll be times when one, something weird will happen or whatever, or, you know, and um, and we're like, oh, okay, we've gone here now, but let's, we've got to get back there somehow, and you just don't, you don't quite know, but you just end up there eventually, you know. Mm. It's, it's kind of nice to see that interplay between people on the stage, like, dealing with a weird situation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it really is. Yeah. Let's switch gears a bit, let's talk about instruments, uh -huh. guitars and gear. Cool. You play the Martin D41. Yeah. I've got a Martin D41 Sunburst at the moment. It's which gorgeous. Is beautiful. Yeah. Um, and I bought that last summer and it's, I, I love it. I totally love it. Um, that's my gigging guitar. It's my working guitar. Um, I love the sustain on it. It's just, it's just really clear and really balanced. And it mm -hmm. works really well. But I've got an older D41 that I used to use that I, is still in the house and um, and it is an absolute session killer. It's so right. loud. Wow. It's crazy loud. And it's and it's got this bass that like I remember the first time I picked it up and played it, it just shook. Like it was just huge. But it's um that one's from nineteen ninety one. And um so obviously it's been played a lot and it's kinda settled in and stuff and it's just stunning. But it's a wee bit more unruly. The the bass on it's a wee bit more unruly. Oh, right. And I don't know whether my sunburst one's gonna end up like that, like down the line. And stuff the more that I play it at the moment it seems to have settled in and it's quite even but um so the sunburst one's better for recording there I find as well right. because it's not you're not trying to get rid of the, the kind of bass 
the crazy flappy bass thing yeah. that's kind of going on with my other guitar but the other one's so much fun to play so so I have the two of them um, and then I've got a D28 as well that I bought whoa, in like 2004 or something like that 2005 which was my gigging guitar for a long time and I, I couldn't really I've not really ever brought myself to part with it even though I don't really play it that much it's just um yeah, it's, it's lovely. Um, yeah, so I've got them. I actually bought I bought a Taylor, like maybe 2013 or something like that. But I found that um, when I was switching between the two guitars, because I still had my Martin D28 at that point that I was gigging with, I found that um, there's a slight string spacing thing, that the Taylors yeah. are a tiny bit wider. And I, f I was finding that my muscle memory, if I was really thinking about it, it was fine. But as soon as you like switched off and you thought oh, I'm just playing my guitar your fingers would be in between the strings and you're like ah and it just yeah. it just never really settled with me so I ended up selling it and then I was like well that's it I'll just have to do Martins and I, I love them so it kind of works quite well yeah <laughs> um, and the 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 kind of the stage sound stuff has like exploded over the last like two years um, I didn't really use pedals like two years ago I don't think, not that much, and um, it was pretty much just a boost pedal for solos, that was mm -hmm. all I was using, and then, and I've been going through loads and loads of pickups, um, and none of them seemed to ever really work, they all just felt just, either it was that they just weren't quite fitted right in the guitar, but they just never, it was, and then I ended up being recommended this, um, the Mimesis pickup, which is the one that Mike Vanden built, he's like a mandolin and guitar maker from right. up north, Strontian I think he's based around there, and um, anyway he built this pickup which then ended up being the Fishman Rare Earth blend, Ooh. and um, so he still makes the original, which got sold to Fishman, and yeah. uh, the theory is that um, that these, these pickups are really, you know, really well made and really beautiful pickups, they've got like a little Omni capsule microphone in the top of the humbucker and it just sits in the sound hole so it's completely removable it doesn't have to be slotted under the bridge so it means that if anything woe betide anything happens to your guitar you can just take it out and shove yeah. it in something else and um, and it's been brilliant it's actually really great mm -hmm. but the problem about it is it, you get a stereo out from it you get a, you know it's, it's like a splitter cable you have yeah. to use um, so now in order to use any effects you have to mix that back together again in order to to use it on any kind of system so it's a bit of a faff and now my pedal board's just getting bigger and bigger because there's more stuff you have to use for it so so you use the grace felix i've got for the grace felix blending. yeah and it is wonderful um so that that's yeah so it blends the signal back together you've got a little bit of um of eq on each of the channels which yeah. is great just for settling things down and then there's an insert point so i, I run all my effects through it and it means everything's just self-contained and it's yeah. one xlr out and I've got control over all all that stuff, and I think you can send separate things out at certain points if you want to, but it works really well for me like that. Um, I've got on my board at the moment. I'm trying to only carry things on the board that I use all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I'd rather have like not that many pedals, but utilize them properly. So I've got the Felix, and I've got a Cali 76 compressor, oh, yeah. which has made quite a difference for small detailed gigs because it just lifts everything up a little bit Interesting. Um, I've been quite enjoying that actually although I'm not using it tonight <laughs> I just I went for like total strip down I've just got the Felix tonight um, I've got a freeze pedal which is like infinite sustain mm -hmm. which is really nice for like just pads underneath stuff I've got a Strymon Big Sky with All like right. three different um, reverbs just at different lengths that I use it's just like stock ones that I use most of the time yeah. but I've got I usually use an effects pedal with it so because within any set you don't just kind of switch on your reverb and that's going to suit mm. an, one arrangement it's like you change so much through an arrangement that you need to be able to ramp it up and then get rid of it and so like an expression pedal yeah, yeah. so it's, it's really cool so it changes the tail length and everything and I really I've been really enjoying using that because it's quite subtle but it's uh, yeah it's pretty good fun mm. i've had a distortion pedal on it but i ditched it recently because i've not been using it for the gigs that i'm on at the moment yeah but that comes back every what do you use that for um just for stupid crazy space noises mm. like i mean there's just some gigs actually the, the gig that i was using it for the most was the ross and alley gig that's okay. that we use quite a lot of effects on that gig so 
it's just an extra layer of stuff. You can just get things a bit more crunchy. But I've not I've not got that one set exactly the way that I want it yet. It's just not doing the job I need. So that's a work in progress. <laughs> um, and so that's that's my guitar sound. And then I've got an octave pedal. I've got like two single string pickups and a little caddy on my guitar. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, so which is totally brilliant. It's um, I use it's a, what's it called Ubertar is the company that makes the single string pickups but there's a guy in Glasgow called Ian Dickinson who is awesome he's got this place called the Guitar Workshop mm-hmm. and he's just been so wonderful I've worked with some amazing guitar fixers over the years it's like Jimmy Egypt as well and Jimmy Moon mm-hmm. for years I used to use both of those and they've been so brilliant and, and more recently Ian's been quite curious about um sort of new innovations and stuff so this Urbitar has been something that he's been working on and he's sort of helped like sort of fit it and he's been designing different things for it and stuff so it's been really cool working yeah. with him and he's you know if your guitar starts making crazy buzzes you can phone him and he's quite happy to try and sort things out for you <laughs> quite yeah. quickly and stuff but yeah the Urbitar runs through um, a sub and up pedal that I've um, that's a TC electronic all oh, right fun. Um, and it's a, and I need to use a mute, a mute switch with it because if you just leave the pedal on the whole time, obviously you've got the bottom two strings sent through the PA system. So <laughs> it, I just leave the sub and up on the whole time and I mute it on and off, so it just kicks in and then disappears. Um, and I've changed the sub and up sound on my laptop to I can't remember what I did. I just faffed about with it because if you plug it into your laptop, you can be playing and be changing stuff in real time. Yeah. On that, and it's and then when you're happy with it, you can you're done, you know, and it just saves that setting. So that's pretty handy actually. That is handy. It's pretty cool because there's some very very different sounds on that pedal. So finding the right one's quite important. I've watched some Anderton shows where they've they've demonstrated that kind yeah. of thing with pedals. Yeah, it's cool. It's a good it's a good thing, and it's touch wood. It's not gone wrong yet. It's just that there's when you're relying so much on technology now to make a big sound. It's the worry is that at some point you're going to have some issues with it, you mm. know. And I like the idea that whatever music I've put together, you can always get away with some version of it acoustic. Yeah. So that you've got a backup, you know. Yeah. There's a power cut or whatever you can, you can manage. I mean, when you're playing with two Highland Pipers, maybe that's not going to be that <laughs> that good. But for most <laughs> of the stuff I work with, it's it's okay. And then the only other thing I've got um, in my kind of like bag of tricks is. Um, a stomp box which is uh, I can't remember what it's called it's one of the Roland like drum samplers but I've um, I've got a piezo pickup stuck to my shoe oh. and my shoe is actually the, the trigger so it means that I can stamp my foot anywhere that I want I can sing into a mic and I don't have to look at stamping on something yeah. physical and I can kick my octave pedal in and the stomp happens at the same time because the piezo just just gets the trigger so that's genius so it's really cool that's like that's been fun developing that but yeah again it's like wow. so many wires I've got this Pelly case now that weighs an absolute ton <laughs> and um, and it's like and I just I got on stage today and did a sound check with just my Felix and in a tuner and I was like I'm free yeah. I'm totally free yeah. and it was like it, yeah it's, it's wonderful making lots of big noises but at the same time it's actually really nice just doing something totally stripped back and yeah, I can totally relate. Yeah. At one yeah. point I was going in, I've got an Apollo twin. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. And I was taking that to gigs with my laptop. Oh, wow. And wow. I was doing all sorts of sends and things mm. with reverb and putting my vocals, splitting my vocals. Oh, yeah. One through that and one into my loop pedal. And it was, oh, I had to have a, a document on my, my phone to yeah. tell me where everything plugged in because I could never remember. Yeah, that was that's the thing. Like When I first started using the pedals, I had um, I was making guitar charts because we were putting together new music mm. for it and stuff. So I'd have like like one half was a column of like the chords I was playing or stops or pushes or whatever you know arrangement stuff on one side, and then there was another column for like what I was doing with my feet. Yeah, <laughs> and you're yeah. like, oh man, this is so complicated. But the more that you do it, the easier it gets. So I've got this gig on a Monday night in Glasgow in Bar Block, and it's uh-huh. like a rock venue it's kind of it's amazing I absolutely love this bar and we do like the acoustic night in there and um, and people come in and they do listen but they don't at the same time so mm. you can just play the biggest amount of crazy stuff and 
and they're just everyone's just quite happy to go with you with it. Yeah. So I've just taken all the pedals along quite a lot recently and just just got used to playing. And now to the point where if I'm playing without them, I, I go to kick them on because um, I know it's part of what yeah. I do now is putting the reverb in there or taking it out yeah. here. And it's yeah, it's kind of cool. It's kind of got to that point now where it feels a lot more intuitive than it used to. That's great. It's just taken a while. Two years. So you've got that sort of anxiety of performing it while you're not on the, under the spotlight. So yeah. you, you're actually yeah practicing performing. Yeah, it's kind of like a sort brilliant. of made jam practice thing. Yeah. But they they really enjoy the fact that it's totally experimental and whatever you hear in there, you're not really ever going to hear again. You know, it's just mm. like in the moment and something really cool about that. That's brilliant. Yeah, it's fun. It's really good fun. And they give you pizza and beer. <laughs> It's awesome. It's cool. Yeah, my band's broke up oh, uh, no. just over a year ago, uh-huh. and I started playing solo gigs, and it was it was a bit of a struggle. So I decided I was going to learn to use a looper, mm-hmm. and I got the Boss RC three hundred, which yeah. has got three pedals. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And that took me a long time to figure out. That's that's a whole other level of like mm. scariness. Yeah. In in the looping, I've not I've not done a lot of the live stuff. I think. I, I tend to shift about my arrangements so much when I'm back in things that I wouldn't be able to create I've never found a loop that I felt like it would work with what it is that I do yeah um, but I'm, it's also probably because I've got a tiny little bit of the fear about it and I've not <laughs> sat down and been like how, how do you work this but I heard um, Ed Sheeran mm-hmm. I, to be fair I've not watched a lot of Ed Sheeran stuff I don't I, I know of him but I've not seen him do the looping thing but apparently his pedal um, that he uses on stage is Ableton. It's like a, yeah. a specifically designed, and it runs off two Mac Minis. It's like huge. That's like insane. Absolutely mental. It's like the, you can take it to like crazy extremes. But I've got like a ditto one. I've got the tiny little nano I know the one, nano yeah. one, and it's like it's so cute. But it's like it's. I've got some <laughs> pedals that have just sat in a filing cabinet for ages, and I've just not. Mm. You kind of need to have them all set out so that when the mood takes you. You could just go and start jamming. And yeah. I've just not managed that for a while. At some point. That's amazing what you can do now. Oh, it's it's so cool. I've got this um, vocal harmonizer as well, which is quite cool. My friend Heather uses one mm-hmm. of them. She plays harp. Classic. Oh yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, Heather McLeod. Uh-huh. She calls this pedal the McLeod Sisters. Ah uh-huh. yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> They're so cool. They're like it's amazing what yeah as you, as you say like what technology is around now mm. it's just finding the stuff that works for you because for that pedal it's great but sometimes it doesn't quite read stuff right and it gets a bit glitchy yeah. and I'm, I'm waiting for the next thing to be designed that's going to be like because we, we do a lot of stuff in Mixolydian as well it's like trad music a lot of it's in yeah. Mixolydian there's no, there's no Mixolydian scale on a lot of the pedals you know mm. or not, not the thing that you need um, for specific tunes and stuff so I'd, I'd love there to be one that you can you can really design the harmonies to fit with really specific stuff because you can save presets for like a hundred different shows yeah so I don't think it's far off but it's just yeah yeah well, that'll come yeah. I'm sure it will yeah yeah be amazing and then I'll have the fear about technology then <laughs> so how do you manage with all the travelling um it's actually not too bad. Is it's, it all UK or do you ever get out of the country? Yeah, it's quite it's quite a lot of travel like abroad. And not not super far. Um my my maximum time that I can really be away for is like twelve days. Just just because of my own enjoyment. Like mm. I can I just I don't like being on the road for ages. I like getting home and um and just being healthy and not, not being on the road all the time. So so twelve days is lovely. Um, a lot of the stuff that I do tends to be away for like two days, three days, and then you're back. Yeah. So, so it's, it means that there's always this reset, and because I've got my commitments at the conservatoire, oh, you always course. reset yourself and you touch I, base. Yeah, and there's something about when you've been out gigging and you get home. Quite often, if you're self-employed, you can feel like, well, what do I do with myself now? Because I'm not answering to anybody. So yeah. you just kind of sit in your house and you get a little bit, you can get a bit down and a bit sort of lost, and as soon as I get back from gigs, 
the next day I just go into the conservatory and it's like uh, you know what your job is you know what you've got to do yeah. it might be mental and you might have to work out how to fix a lot of random things and you know and all sorts of stuff that goes on in there it's, but it's it's really cool to know that you've got a place that you need to be and, and stuff that you need to do for that so it kind of keeps you driven and then I just don't really ever stop I think that's the problem for me is I've like if I if I get a day off, it's that like I feel quite guilty. And then um, my partner, he's a sound engineer, so he's kind of got the same job. He kind of knows the deal. But the last time I had like a proper like maybe two days off, I was in the house and I was just it was maybe April time or something, and I was just wandering aimlessly around the house and I didn't even know I was doing it. I was just like <laughs> like this, and he just came through and he was like, "Will you just sit and watch the TV or something?" And I was like, "What?" And he's like, "You don't know how to have any time off. Just go mm. and." just go and do something you know and it is it is hard to find that balance and I, I'd imagine that especially if you have a family I mean it's just the two of us so we don't really like w we find time for each other but it's not a huge pressure to try and yeah. make sure that I'm at home and for him too um so yeah I can imagine that that's a whole other other kettle of fish and stuff but um I, I like being busy and I'm just so lucky that the job that I've got is something that that I love doing and I would have spent, like, if I had any other job in the world, I would have spent all of my money and time playing music anyway. Right. So I might as well not get paid as much, but spend all of my time doing it. <laughs> Do well, know? that's the dream. Like, Although yeah. I hear a lot of people talking about living your passion and earning from your your passion mm -hmm. can kind of kill it a wee bit. I, um, sometimes, yeah. It mm. like, I've got a lot of different bands and a lot of different jobs that I do. And... I feel different things about them at different times and they've all got something wonderful about them but they've probably all got something stressful about them as well yeah. and I think if you can jump between projects so that you, you're not all of your stresses or whatever or feelings aren't all tied to one thing yeah. then I think that that's you know I think that's that's a really really big thing for your mental health and are you able to make that switch yeah yeah I think so far anyway I've, I've done alright and so which ones are your sort of creative projects? Um, I guess they all kind of are in a way, but the ones that, that are my voice, I suppose, are definitely the duo with Laura Beth. Like that's the two yeah. of us just throwing everything into into the pot. Um, and the Canaris Quintet as well. That's that's a big, uh -huh. heavy, like my influence thing. Um, and then there's ones that are, I'm actually emulating other people um, like the Ross and Ali project, like Ross, no, sorry, Ali actually plays the, the guitar and stuff. So it's the two of them together that have created all of their music along with a, um, their sort of engineer slash electronic musician, um, Andrea. Mm -hmm. right. So it's like they're a trio. And uh, and I just kind of come in and cover the parts that, that they can't play live. Mm -hmm. So which tends to be the guitar stuff and they, mm -hmm. they jump on with all the other bits and pieces. Um, and in that respect, I've learned a lot of um, of Ali's parts but then they've kind of morphed into being my parts over time yeah. as well so I guess I, I do a bit more of emulating Ali in that uh, and then and then there's stuff like I play with Ryan Young who's I've a, seen some a fiddle player yeah. he's totally amazing and he's really cool because uh, he he sort of he lets me do whatever like we we get on stage and we don't know what we're going to play and um, there's plans for like what key we're going to go into but I don't know how many times through don't mm. know when he's going to play a variation no idea and he he likes that because it keeps everything exciting yeah um, which he's totally right about I got really frustrated in the beginning with it because I can do so much more than what I can do when I'm just improvising in the moment but I've come to realise that what I do when I'm improvising in the moment is something different and that's also special yeah. so it's it's been a bit of a okay don't have to play all the flashy stuff all the time I can just sit on this one chord and it can be fine you know and I think that was a big thing for me to to realise but he's got certain things that he feels not happy about that I would do so certain chords at certain places that he'll be like see that second chord that you played in the B part of the third tune in that set could you not play that one again and I'm like which chord <laughs> and um, and now I've got to know him enough, and he's got to know me enough that he's he's comfortable enough to tell me, but he knows that he's got to leave me a bit of leeway. 
Yeah. And and I've been comfortable enough to be able to take that and not feel like it's him saying something bad about my playing. It's just about the vision mm. that he's got for what he wants something to sound like. And slowly we've kind of both met in the middle with it. And and it's become this really cool thing. And are these his compositions you're playing? Or uh, no, they're all really really old Scottish tunes. Right. Mostly. Um, there's a, occasionally you'll play something that's a bit more contemporary, but mainly really, really old. So he must be hearing the harmony in his head then? Yeah, when he's yeah definitely. And he'll never tell me, like, play this chord here or whatever. It's more, it's more a feeling. He's all about tension and release and stuff, and I'm the same. Mm. I don't like just playing in one dynamic. I get really frustrated. Um, it's why I like playing in sessions and stuff, but I like it more when you're playing in a quiet room with a couple of people because it's that, um, it's, it's the interplay between people and yeah. and the reactions that you get in the moment and, and the louds and the softs and the shape to everything that that's where I find kind of, I guess, satisfaction, musical satisfaction. Yeah. I love that. So working with him is really interesting for that. But I think everybody that I work with has got that to some respect. Maybe everyone's got a different idea about what that is, but they're all pretty sensitive. Different ways. <laughs> Maybe not when you're playing the Highland bagpipes, because that's you're kind of on or off with that. Yeah. But there's some really cool grooves and stuff you can get with it. So. Yeah. It's lovely that you're able to express yourself in a, a, a situation like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's the thing I struggle with. Is if I haven't rehearsed something or yeah learnt it properly, then I'm a bit. It's kind of it's hard, isn't it, to let go? I think years of playing that the gig that I do on the Monday night the, the residency thing mm. that I've got I think years of experimenting in that situation where you're on the spot but you're not Yeah. but you have to step up and you can't hide behind anybody else mm. um, I think that that has given me so much more freedom um, and I think just jamming with totally amazing session players in Glasgow over the years I've been so lucky with that because I, I play the fiddle a bit as well and I remember at the beginning of the year I was like I was recording fiddle tunes into Logic or whatever and then and then playing the guitar on top and I realised it's like I've got knowledge and understanding on the fiddle mm -hmm. and some some skill obviously I'm not going to say that I'm rubbish at it like I, I know I know what I'm doing I just might not be able to execute it exactly the way that I would like but then I went to play the guitar on top of me playing the fiddle and I realised how much easier and how much more together it was when I was playing the guitar and I was yeah. like ah okay I, like this is a whole different like being able to say exactly what I want to say at a certain point which yeah. I just couldn't do on the fiddle and that's just come from years of just doing the same the same thing and I don't know when it clicked there was a point a few years ago I say a few years ago probably quite a few years ago now where you know when you when you play an instrument that you're not really used to it feels massive and it feels quite unwieldy Mm -hmm. And as and as you get better at that instrument, it feels smaller and smaller. Weirdly, I don't know if that's something that you felt, but it's like I remember at one point my guitar just feeling a lot smaller all of a sudden, and it was just like, oh, this is kind of just part of me now, rather than me trying to yeah. manage it and juggle it and stuff. Yeah, I get what you're saying. I remember, I remember that being such a cool feeling of like, oh, okay. I got that yeah. <laughs> interestingly. When I started to play standing up, that, oh, that yeah. changed a lot for me uh -huh. because I felt able to move yeah. my feet and I was moving around the stage and the guitar felt much more part of me. Yeah. And so now, I, if I can, I, I choose to stand. Yeah, I've I've got a student at the conservatory who's like mm. that. He just he really and and he's so expressive that he he kind of needs to. Yeah. Uh, some people feel quite hemmed in when they sit down. I like it because I can just put my head down and focus, but. Yeah, and once you play, you, you have great posture. You play your, your back straight. And <laughs> Just like me. No. <laughs> and it, it looks effortless. The, it's, the way you, yeah. Your rhythm. Oh, it's just so geez. tight. It's locked in. That's That's been a really big thing for me. Forever. And I don't, I think that was just something from when I was a kid. I don't, I think I remember even like bowing and stuff when I was playing the fiddle. It was always, it, like timing and, and, and connecting with people was always so important. I've never actually sat down with a metronome and been like... I've told other students... I, I tell other students to practice with a metronome, but I, nev I never did it myself, and it seems a bit <laughs> random. Yeah, but it's like... So how do you do it then? Do you just, like... I, like, jamming with other people 
mm. like must be a really really important thing because that was part of my formative years at playing was just sitting playing loads of tunes loads of sessions and stuff rather than rather than jamming with a metronome it's definitely handy playing with click tracks on live gigs gets you yeah. really really so you'll solid. be using in-ears then I do on on the Ross and Ellie gig yeah yeah. I tried to introduce that to our band and it mm-hmm. <laughs> didn't it's go hard. Well. It's yeah. hard and it removes it removes a certain element of the fun of performance. Mm. Um but you you're doing it it's kind of a sacrifice that's worth it for for what you can achieve and what you can give to people in a live setting because you can yeah. never do that or emulate that in any other way. Um so yeah, we did a month on in ears mm. in March. Loads of gigs mm. and and it was really cool because it's like by the end of it you're like oh yeah like the metronome is in my head I mean I was asleep at night and I could hear the clicks in my head wow. <laughs> it's just like maybe slightly like torture but <laughs> but it's, it's really cool and, and and I did notice like um, just just my handling of, of pulse afterwards I mean I guess the thing is that you need to be playing with other people who have that same handling of pulse because then when you go and jam with other people who don't or maybe they, they deviate a little bit that's a good point. You're you're kind of like you have to sort of step back into, into their sense of timing, whatever yeah. that is. If it's got a push and pull, and and be able to sit there too. You can't just always be metronomic. You've got to yeah work with whoever you're working with and find out what they're all about and go with that too. So yeah, it's an interesting one. A bit of both is good though. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, aware of your time, you oh, yeah. go and get ready for your gig tonight. Yeah, it's dinner time. Woo-hoo. Dinner time. Um, you're yeah. playing with LB tonight in Brodick Hall. Yep. I look forward to seeing that. You just let people know how they would find where you're going to be if they wanted to look you up. Yeah. So I'm on. I've got a website which is Jen Butterworth with two ends dot co dot uk. Because my um, wife pointed out to me when I wrote it to you earlier. Oh she yeah. Said, it's two ends. I two said, ends. Sorry. I know. Yeah. That always. That always. Well, at least it's not Jean. I get Jean or Jane as well. And stuff. <laughs> but, no. So yeah, I've got a website. Um, but I'm not that great at updating it because I've also got Facebook and Twitter mm. and Instagram of which it's all Jen Butterworth, I think if you look for Jen Butterworth anyway there's not that many of us um, I think it's Jen Butterworth Music on Facebook but yeah, um, Facebook and Twitter probably the easiest places to keep track of what I'm up to Excellent. and um, yeah Great, well thank you very much for coming round and sitting with me oh, thanks for I've having me I've enjoyed talking very much and I look forward to seeing you play tonight. Cheers. Thank you, Jen. See you then. <laughs> well, big thank you to Jen once again. That was a great interview. It was lovely to talk to you. Sorry for some of the technical hitches that we had while recording. I had about five minutes to prepare between my band practice and Jen's coming round, so we did have a bit of an issue trying to get one of the microphones to, it was actually a routing issue, as the Americans say, a routing issue as we like to say, on the Presonus mixer behind me here, I wasn't able to get the signal into my DAW, which is Studio One, but I used a, a backup system and did manage to get some usable audio, so it's not quite as good as I would have liked, but the content is as good. Listening to Jen's talking was was really interesting and I hope you enjoyed listening to her. Haste you back, Jen. I would love to have you back someday or perhaps I'll see you in Glasgow at Bar Block, you never know. Or somewhere else, because I know you're touring a lot. So uh, I'm going to be up at the Alapool Guitar Festival in October. So maybe see you there, who knows? Thanks for watching folks and for listening. This is going up on my podcast feed and I've decided that I'm going to do a bit more of a video element to my my content because I think that that adds quite a lot when you get to watch an interview and not just listen. So obviously there's audio there for those who want to listen on the go. That's how I tend to listen to my podcasts when I'm doing the dishes, walking the dogs, the dogs that are barking outside the house just now. <laughs> And so uh, I'm going to be working on the video, tweaking it, using multi-camera shoots, that sort of thing. Just trying to to get better at this, my editing, my technical setup, the whole thing. So just keep an eye out for more content coming soon. 
I'm travelling down to the Cotswolds at the end of June 2019, which is where I debuted this podcast with my interview with Will McNichol and with Gordon Giltrap. So that's taking place at the end of the month. I'm hopefully going to get a chance to sit down with Clive Carroll. I don't know if any of you have heard, probably if you're watching this channel, you're the kind of person that will have heard of Clive. He's one of the premier fingerstyle guitar players on the circuit just now. Phenomenal player. So I really hope that Clive will, will be up for sitting down and having a blather with me down at Spring Hill Manor in the Cotswolds. And also Mike Dawes, another fingerstyle phenomenon. If you haven't checked out Mike Dawes' content, you should listen to his music. He's, he's one of the best. So we're going to get to see both of those artists in concert and hopefully I'll get to talk to them as well. Along with some of the other guys and girls that are at this gathering, some of whom have been going on and off for 21 years. So I will hope, hopefully bring you more interviews from that. I'll also be down at Halifax in September. I brought you some content from there last year. That's the Acoustic Soundboard UK gathering, which takes place annually, usually in September. This will be my second one, and so I'll be taking my cameras and what have you and hopefully getting some good content for you from there. So it's going to be a busy year. This is the, the starting time kicking off my new season, let's call it, with this interview that you've just watched with Jen. And I'll be publishing some more concert footage as well. I did film a lot of the Aran Folk Festival concerts with two camera shoots and some separate audio. So I haven't gone through it yet. Hopefully the content's going to be quite good. So I'll be bringing you some, some videos from there. Look out for that on the channel very soon. So without any further ado, I will publish. I'll say goodbye and thank you for watching. If you'd like to get in touch, you can do that on cams at acousticguitar.io. That's my email address. And of course, you can just publish comments in the box. I will try and respond to all of your comments. And a big thank you to all of you who've subscribed to my YouTube channel. I just made 100 subscribers, which was a big moment. That allowed me to change my URL, so I've got a custom URL now on YouTube, which is Acoustic Guitar I.O. I'm on Facebook and Instagram and all that usual stuff, so you'll find me wherever you go. Acoustic Guitar I.O. is the channel. If you enjoyed this and would like to subscribe, I would love to have you. I really, really would appreciate it. I'm trying to grow this, this fledging, fledgling channel into something valuable, and so if you could subscribe, that would help me out a lot. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.